Hello and welcome to the second video uh, in our Weimar content series uh, and in today we're going to be finishing off and revising the remaining key content for Weimar Germany and the rise of the Nazis and it is basically from 1928 onwards to the end of the course. Uh, so kind of just a bit before we start the rationale for this is because uh, we are kind of carrying on with where we left off last time which is with the Wall Street crash which I believe um, is is the key turning point. Uh, in the in the period so that's the reason why it's starting like this um in terms of kind of how you should take notes uh, the amount of content that it, we are going to be going through is quite extensive um if you are targeting uh grades five grade six you need to know uh kind of uh, you need to have a good uh, overview of all the key information that's on these slides if you're targeting the higher grades so grades seven eight and nine um, then you want to be making kind of a note of nearly all the key pieces of specific evidence, dates, names, key events, and so on. Um, so let's start off then with 1929 and the Wall Street crash. So kind of a bit of an overview of what the Wall Street crash is. So the Wall Street crash refers to in October 1929, where share prices fell on the Wall Street Stock Exchange in New York. Uh, and that meant that people's investments fell in value uh, and that people then decided to uh, sell their shares before they fell further and that event is known as Black Thursday which is basically where there was a big run on the banks and because they people saw the economy was declining they thought that they would cash in um, to avoid losing more money but because everyone was cashing in their kind of shares uh, it meant that the, the uh, economy became even more unstable and then fell even further. <coughs> so how does this or why does this affect Germany? So major German banks, uh, because of the reparations, so the £6.6 .6 billion pounds of reparations um, imposed upon them by the diktat, so the dictated piece of the Treaty of Versailles, many of those German banks had invested in the US stock exchange. Um, and as a result, this loss of money in the US led to a, a massive panic and people rushing in Germany to also get their money out as well. Okay, so there was almost like a Black Thursday that happened in Germany as well. Um, German industry fully collapsed uh, because German banks, you know, with this run on the banks, they demanded that they receive the loans back that they'd lent to people. Um, so German industry all of a sudden had to pay up and pay back their loans um, and they could not manage that. Um, and then the USA had also been crucial to the economic recovery of Germany. So let's not forget the importance of the Doors plan, which we explored in the previous video. So the, that $25 billion loan um, Again, that proves how dependent uh, Germany was upon the US for economic support. So without that, there's going to be quite negative impacts on Germany. There's a famous saying, which is, uh, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. Uh, and you're going to see on the next slide the kind of cold that Germany caught. So the key consequences of the Wall Street crash are on the screen and uh, are as follows. So the collapse of German industry led to a massive increase in unemployment. So in September 1929, unemployment was at 1.3 million, but just four years later, it was over 6 million. Okay, so it's a huge number of people unemployed. German industry failed um, and collapsed. So there was a 40% fall in industrial output. So that's the amount that factories produced, the total amount uh, between 1929 and 1932. Um, the impact of unemployment on the people, so there was a reduction in unemployment benefits. Uh, because there were so many unemployed people, the uh, government just could not handle, could not cope with how many unemployed people there were, essentially. Uh, savings became worthless overnight because the, the value of money fell. Uh, there was a 70% reduction in wages, um, and then there was an increase in criminality as a result. So there's a 24% rise of, in theft in Berlin. Uh, and the key thing is that the Weimar government fails to deal with the problem. So these problems that we've already mentioned, they fail. So Heinrich Brüning, the new chancellor after Gustav Stresemann, uh, he actually does many things to annoy people. So first thing is he increases taxes to try and raise more money for the government to kind of deal with the situation. But what that does is it alienates the right wing in society. He then reduces unemployment benefits, which angers the left wing in society. So the people who kind of care about the working people. Um, and kind of their welfare. So he basically alienates the Weimar government from both the right and the left wing. Um, and because of that, the Reichstag, so the German parliament, refuses to pass his laws uh, and they stop meeting as frequently. Um, so they only meet three, 13 times in 1932, despite their being in the middle of a crisis. Uh, and the reason why they're meeting fewer times is because Brüning is relying less upon the Reichstag for uh, kind of his ideas to become laws. Instead, he's relying more upon Article 48, 
which if you cast your mind back to the previous video, is where the Weimar government can pass a law, so the Chancellor can pass a law without having to go through via the Reichstag. Uh, so all of this means that Hitler and the NSDAP, so the Nazi party, uh, in addition to the German Communist Party, actually see a big improvement in terms of their political performances. So the SPD, so the Weimar government, um, they actually see a decline in the number of seats, which you can see on the screen now. And then uh, Hitler and the NSDAP see an explosion in popularity. So, excuse me, in May 1928, they had just 12 seats, and yet by July 1932, they have 230. Okay, And as you can see as well, the communists also do increase their share of the vote as well. So, in, uh, in terms of the Nazis and why they increased their support, it's partly down uh, to the, the Wall Street crash. But let's not forget the uh, kind of importance of factors within the Nazi party. So we have the personal appeal of Hitler, so his kind of charisma, his charm, his personality. The use of new election strategies, so the use of aeroplanes during election campaigns, so they would kind of get aeroplanes to fly, um, kind of slogans to promote the Nazi party. The use of stormtroopers, so the fact that 400,000 stormtroopers um, were kind of the Nazis' private army, essentially, whereas the communists only had 130,000. And these, these stormtroopers would intimidate uh, rival candidates, they would use violence, um, and for just for example, they killed 18 people in a 1932 clash in Hamburg. And then finally, uh, he's, his appeal to different sections of German society. So the first thing is he gets big business on side. So he gets loans from uh, kind of Mercedes-Benz, so it, Benz in this case, the businessman. Um, he uh, works with, so he kind of like gets Goebbels, uh, who's his chief of propaganda, to convince Alfred Hugenberg, the newspaper tycoon, to side with the Nazis. So that means they can now publish uh, kind of their, their stories and promote their message using the press. Uh, he tries to attract working class support through the slogan of work and bread. He tries to increase middle class support. Uh, and after all, they're very receptive, um, the middle classes are, because of the decline that they, they saw in terms of society under the Weimar government. Um, he promises farmers their land. So beforehand, he, there had been this idea that the Nazi party would confiscate all private land. Now they said that only the land of Jews would be confiscated. Um, and as you can see as well, young people were increasingly attracted to the party, uh, as were women as well. Um, the key thing to make a note of, though, is although he was trying to attract people from all different swathes and sections of society, uh, the working classes did still prefer communists, okay? So that was an ongoing kind of issue for Hitler, was how to attract uh, the working class vote. Um, so how does Hitler become Chancellor? So a bit of kind of context. So in 1930, the Nazi party only has 107 seats, but by 1933, Hitler has become Chancellor. Um, and kind of the, these are the key timeline of events, all right? And this, we're gonna go through about 10 events. So the first event, is the man who's the president at the time, so Paul von Hindenburg, who was a bit of a legend in German society. Uh, he was persuaded reluctantly to stand for election again. Um, at the same time, Hitler was campaigning furiously for the 1932 elections, uh, and he does actually lose the 1932 election. But what you can see in the bottom uh, of, of the actually increase his overall share. So I'll just annotate it there. You can see the fact that he has attracted 13 million votes. Okay, So that's 36% of the total vote, uh, which is a massive improvement on previous Nazi party results. Um, and following the April 1932 election, the problems for the Weimar government went from bad to worse. So Chancellor Brüning tries to ban the uh, stormtroopers and the Schutzstaffel, so the SS, and that leads to further unrest. And then he announces a plan to buy up land from the large landowners. So he's basically what he's doing is he's alienating the right wingers in society. So it, in particular, the people who support the Nazis, um, but also the middle classes as well. So because of that, Brüning is forced to resign and a man called von Schleicher to try and kind of remedy the situation, suggests a wealthy politician, a wealthy businessman, Franz von Papen, uh, should be picked as the next chancellor. Um, and what would, to kind of make this work essentially, von Schleicher suggested that uh, von Papen have the support of the Nazis because it was thought that they would be easy to control, all right? And von Papen's rule is known as the cabinet of barons. Uh, von Papen does a poor job of running the country. Uh, and as a result, in the Reichstag elections of July 1932, Hitler wins 
230 seats in the Reichstag, which was a massive improvement. It's 100 plus. Uh, if you go back to one of the earlier slides, I think it's slide six, you can see the, that uh, the Nazi party had only got 107 seats in September 1930. So he's added over 100 seats in the space of a couple of years. So von Papelin is forced to resign. Uh, von Schleicher takes his place, but he doesn't have any real power uh, and he basically can't pass many laws. Uh, so he threatens to take over power in a military dictatorship and then von Papen and Hindenburg decide to make Hitler Chancellor in January 1933 because they're worried about von Schleicher setting up a military dictatorship. It's agreed that von Papen would become Hitler's vice chancellor and it was thought that they could still control Hitler and that Hitler would still be amenable um, and they are very, very wrong. So a bit of context, so Hitler kind of becoming a Fuhrer. So the, from the 30th of January 1933, Hitler is Chancellor of Germany, but his power is limited by the following things, okay? So the first thing is that the Weimar Constitution controls what the Chancellor can do. Hindenburg retains all the powers of the President. Hitler's cabinet has 12 members, but only two of them are actually uh, kind of his colleagues. So Wilhelm Frick and Hermann Göring. And then the NSDAP, so the Nazi members, uh, only make up a third of the Reichstag. So as you can see from these kind of uh, facts here, Hitler is in a weak position. So he basically tries to consolidate his power and he does so through four things. Okay, so there's four major events uh, and then we're going to look at the, 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 the fifth most important event, which is the Night of the Long Knives. So the first thing is the Reichstag fire of uh, February 1933. It's where a uh, Dutch communist, Marinus van der Lubb, uh, sets the Reichstag on fire. And Hitler basically claims that van der Lubbe is part of a communist conspiracy. And he arrests and uses his, his kind of actions as a pretext to arrest 4,000 communists on the same night. Um, shortly after, so in March 1933, he passes the Enabling Act, uh, which is basically um, where... Uh, he, the Reich's cabinet can pass new laws uh, and the laws will be proposed by the Chancellor uh, Hitler. So that basically means that Hitler can make laws uh, for four years without the consent of Parliament. So it gives him almost unlimited power, essentially. Uh, similarly as well, during the Reichstag elections in the same month, uh, he also does very, very well. So the first thing is he issues the decree for the protection of the people and the state, and that allows him to imprison any kind of opponents. Uh, and he also now has control of Germany's police force. Uh, he then gets Gustav Krupp, so the famous German businessman, on side, uh, and he conducts a very bloody election campaign, but by the end he's increased his total share of the votes to 288 seats. So again, he's seeing big, big improvements, um, despite having such a violent election campaign. And then finally, in terms of his rise to become Führer, uh, he removes all opposition. So trade unions are made illegal. Uh, May 1933 as well, the stormtroopers enter the offices of the SDP and the KPD, uh, and they destroy their newspapers and confiscate their funds. And then the local councils, so regional councils, which rule over the kind of local areas, uh, the lander parliaments, are abolished. And then Hitler basically appoints governors to rule over every region in Germany. Now, the biggest step he takes to become Führer is the Night of the Long Knives. And the context behind this uh, is the power of Ernst Röhm. Okay? So he's basically concerned about Ernst Röhm, who we mentioned briefly in the previous video. So Ernst Röhm has control over the stormtroopers, and stormtroopers are very loyal to Ernst Röhm. Um, that's partly because uh, he is, he's obviously their leader, but also because 60% of them were unemployed and they were quite angry and discontented and they uh, and Rome was basically quite critical of Hitler's policies, in particular Hitler's uh, kind of right wing fascist policies. Rome was more of a socialist. Um, so the leaders of the German army and then Reinhard Heydrich, the leader of the Schutzstaffel, so Hitler's private army, they also want to reduce the power of Rome, so they kind of team up with Hitler. And basically, uh, in the Night of the Long Knives, you can see the two event, the kind of event is summarised there at the bottom. So as a result of all of this, Hitler basically arranges to remove the threat of Rome and the stormtroopers. He arranges a meeting with them at a hotel and he basically arrests, imprisons and shoots Rome and other senior officers. And that event is known as the Long Knives. All right. Um, and I would also then kind of think about what happens afterwards to von Papen as well. So the fact that uh, von Papen is told that the, the Schutzstaffel has things under control and that he should return home for his own safety. And then when he does actually 
kind of return home. Uh, some of the SS arrive at von Papen's office and shoot his press secretary and arrest his staff. Um, so von Papen has lost all of his power as well as a result of this event. All right, um, and his claim that he had Hitler in his pocket is clearly disproved. Okay, and then our final event in how Hitler becomes Führer is the death of Paul von Hindenburg. So Hindenburg, at the age of 87, uh, pops his clogs in August 1934, and Hitler becomes Führer. Now, the key thing to make a note of for the role of Führer is that it will combine the powers of president with that of the chancellor. Okay, So Hitler has almost unlimited power, and this is what makes him a dictator. So he has the uh, kind of power of the economy by being chancellor, but then he also has the political power of the president. And Hitler uses his new power uh, to force an oath of loyalty from every soldier in the army. Uh, and he's so confident that he holds a plebiscite, so a vote, uh, on the 19th of August. And overwhelmingly, so 90% of German voters vote in favour of Hitler becoming few. Um, now, obviously, he used intimidation. Those votes are not potentially accurate. And there was a massive use of propaganda to convince people to vote for him. Um, but you can still see his, the level of his popularity. So now that the Nazis are in control, we now need to examine what is known as the Nazi police state. And there's three components to the police state. So first of all is the Schutzstaffel, uh, so the SS, and they're Hitler's personal bodyguard, and they're loyal to Hitler and Himmler. Okay? Um, under the SS, we have something called the SD. They're a monitoring and surveillance force, and their leader is a man called Reinhard Heydrich, who plays a very important role. Um, in the Holocaust. Um, but the SD's job is to basically spy on kind of the Nazi's opponents. Uh, and similarly as well, um, the SS also manages something called the Gestapo, which is basically a secret police force, but they're not uniformed, okay? So they're kind of always undercover. They're also under the leadership of Heydrich, and they would spy on people, they would tap phones, uh, they would use informants, so people to kind of snitch on other people. Uh, and they arrested 160,000 people in just the space of one year in 1939 uh, for political offences. And they often made use of torture. So the Gestapo would basically, uh, they, they would wage what is known as kind of psychological, not warfare, but their, their tactics were very psychological. So they would arrive often early in the mornings uh, to take suspects away. Uh, and many prisoners died in custody or were sent to concentration camps. Um, but the fear of the Gestapo is actually more uh, significant than the Gestapo itself. So there were never more than 30,000 members of the Gestapo. Uh, and in Hamburg, for example, there, was only, there were fewer than 50 officers. Uh, they pose more of a psychological threat. The fact that they're kind of, you know, they're non-uniformed and you don't know who they are. And they're constantly looking to arrest people. They're, there's a psychological threat to people there. Um, now, in terms of concentration camps, I've put some information at the bottom of this slide. So you might want to pause uh, pause it and have a read through that. The key piece of information is obviously the first Nazi concentration camp is opened at Dachau. Uh, initially, it's a place for political uh, opposition, but also for people who are like uh, seen as undesirable. So that would be a prostitute, homosexuals, uh, but also people who are kind of considered, um, you know, as as minority groups so, such as such as Jewish people. So, in addition to uh, the three components of the police state, we also need to look and examine the legal system. So, we've I've separated this into controlling the judges and controlling the law courts. So, Hitler sets up something called the National Socialist League for the Maintenance of the Law, and that basically mandates for all judges to sign up, uh, and if a judge was against the Nazis, they were banned from, uh, from joining. Uh, and what this league does is it basically ensures that the interests of the Nazi party are constantly maintained throughout the legal system. Uh, the jury was removed. Um, so instead of letting people decide upon a person's guilt, the judge would now decide everything. Um, and judges were selected carefully uh, and trials were held in secret. And in, a people's court, in the people's court... Um, that's basically where the judges for this court were almost handpicked by Hitler himself, all right? And uh, he would impose sentences and there was no right to appeal. Um, so in between 1934 and 1939, 534 people lost their life in this way. Um, we also need to consider Hitler and religion because this is again still part of his police state by trying to establish his control uh, and dominate all aspects of society, which is, if we remember what a police state is, that is kind of a central central part of the definition. So in terms of the Catholic Church, there was tension 
Firstly, we, because of the Catholic's allegiance to the Pope and then the existence of Catholic schools for, the, for young people. Uh, so what Hitler needs to do is he needs to get the Catholic Church on side. So he signs something called the Concordat with the Pope, which is an agreement. And that agreement stipulates that uh, Hitler would not interfere with Catholic schools. And in return, the Catholic Church would not interfere with politics or the Nazi regime. Uh, now, a few years after signing this, he breaks all of his promises. So he starts to harass Catholic priests. Many of them are sent to concentration camps. Catholic schools are closed and the Catholic Youth League was banned. Uh, and in 1937, Pope Pius XI reflected upon kind of the betrayal of Hitler and wrote his famous With Burning Anxiety, uh, which was kind of a formal uh, denunciation or criticism of the Nazis' failure to keep their promises. Um, in terms of the Protestant Church, so that was all the information that I've just talked about was the Catholic Church, but now moving to the Protestant Church. Um, Hitler and the Nazis set up something called the Reich Church, and the leader of the Reich Church was Ludwig Müller. And there were 2,000 members, uh, sorry, 2,000 pastors were members, and they supported Nazi policies in their sermons, they would display swastikas in their churches, they would rewrite, kind of, and, and in, in their sermons they would present Christianity from a Nazified way, so it's known as the Nazification of Christianity, and uh, they banned the Jewish Old Testament. Uh, but there was significant opposition to the Reich's Church, so there's something called the Pastors' Emergency League, and they actually had three times the number of pastors uh, in their membership. So there's 6,000 pastors protesting against Nazi ideas, and 800 of them were eventually arrested and sent to concentration camps. Okay, so now we need to think about kind of moving on from the police state. We need to think about the importance of propaganda uh, and how that was used to further extend Hitler and the Nazis' control throughout society. So in 1933, Hitler makes Joseph Goebbels the Minister of People's Enlightenment and Propaganda. Goebbels has control of the media, so he has control over the newspapers and they're given briefings on what they're allowed to write. He also closes down newspapers as well, which shows us that all newspapers were under Nazi control. Uh, radio stations were also under Nazi control, and 70% of German homes had a radio by 1939, and radios were used as a vehicle for the Nazis to kind of spread their ideas and uh, with, with the masses and with the people. Um, the, the Nazis also relied heavily upon rallies, so they, they have a mass rally at Nuremberg each year, uh, and the 1934 Nuremberg rally is very, very uh, famous and very important. They would use sport as well, so Nazi symbols, Nazi salutes. They used the, the, the kind of new stadium in Berlin for the Berlin Olympics as an example of their kind of to reflect their power as a nation uh, because it could hold up to 110,000 people, which was like an unprecedented number at the time. Um, and the stadium was decked out with swastikas and other symbols and Germany won the highest number of medals in, in the Olympics. Uh, he controlled culture and the arts, so the Reich Chamber of Culture kind of had uh, a supervisory role, so they would kind of uh, oversee and monitor and then ban cultural activities which go against the Nazi beliefs. We had the Reich Chamber of Visual Arts, so all painters and sculptors had to apply, and any artists who were rejected had their membership taken away, and they were forbidden to teach, produce or sell art. Uh, and in 1936, over 12,000 paintings and sculptures were removed from art galleries. Um, and I'll just put up as well the kind of four other strands in which he had kind of uh, in which Goebbels extended control of the Nazis throughout society. So the fact that architecture became uh, kind of uh, placed more emphasis on showing the power of the Nazis rather than the futuristic Weimar designs. And Albert Speer is a really good example of that. Uh, the fact that music was controlled and jazz music was banned and classical music was favoured. Uh, so jazz music was banned because it was actually seen to be associated and linked with uh, black people. So there was a ra kind of a racial justification for its banning. Uh, <clears throat> so in terms of literature, no new books could be published without the approval from the Chamber of Culture. Uh, so writers were banned and there's famously the book burning bonfires. So books which went against Nazi views were taken from universities, public buildings, libraries, uh, they were burnt on huge public bonfires, uh, especially books written by Jewish people, and then films as well. So if you went to the cinema uh, in Nazi Germany, each film was preceded by a 45-minute official Nazi newsreel promoting the Nazis and kind of their, their outlook on, on life. Um, and that was significant because in 1933 alone, there were 250 million visits to the cinema. So that meant that on average, um, there were, you know, on average, the kind of German, the average German person went to the cinema three times uh, in 1933. 
um, which is really significant because that means you know that's 250 million examples of exposure to that 45 minute newsreel um, so let's just think about some opposition and resistance to Hitler and kind of let's evaluate how significant the opposition was. So the first thing is we have is the Pastors Emergency League uh, under Martin Nimola uh, and they basically uh, oppose the Protestant churches. We've talked about that already very briefly, uh, but crucially they set up something called the Confessing Church. Okay, Now the Confessing Church uh, is basically a, an alternative to the Reichschurch and they have 6,000 pastors as I've already mentioned earlier. All right, um, So that's significant. Uh, we also have the Catholic opposition, so 400 priests were imprisoned in Dachau concentration camps, uh, and the fact that there were key figures as well who were arguing against Nazi interference in the church and treatment of Jews. So part Martin Niemöller uh, was kind of doing that, and he, in 1938 he was sent to Sachsenhausen concentration camp, uh, and crucially he'd actually been a Nazi supporter in the early days, but he changes his perspective uh, because of Hitler's treatment of the Catholic Church. Uh, youth opposition, which is always the kind of most interesting. So we have the Edelweiss pirates. Uh, they were teenage boys and girls who basically challenged the, the kind of Nazi youth groups. They had long hair. Uh, they were quite kind of almost what we would class as like hippies, essentially. Uh, and they would attack members of the Hitler youth. Uh, but crucially, they only have 2,000 members, whereas the Hitler Youth in 1939 had 8 million. So if in an exam question came up on kind of Hitler Youth, you could use this as an example of, of Hitler Youth, uh, oh, sorry, the Hitler Youth being very powerful and opposition being quite weak. Um, so 2,000 members is, is really small. Uh, and then we also had something called the Swing Youth, and they called that because they were admirers of American culture and kind of uh, American swing culture, which is, as far as I'm aware, kind of linked to music. Uh, and they would play illegal music from America and they would organise illegal dances. Um, so their way of resistance was, was through music. Um, life in Nazi Germany now, so we're now going to think about how does Hitler rule over society uh, and that will take us up to the end of the video. So we're going to think about how he treats the different members of society. So it, on the left there you've got the expectations for women uh, in, in Germany. So the fact that women should be confined to the domestic sphere, that women should have a natural look and that they, there's a clear emphasis on marriage and having a large family. Uh, Gertrude Schultz Klink is the woman that you need to know about. So she was the Reich woman's leader and she was in charge of policies to do with women. In reality, she's what is known as, as a figurehead. So she didn't really have that much of a say. She was more kind of like a puppet who would enforce what Hitler and the, the, the Nazis wanted. Uh, but they did want to have a woman in charge of, uh, of the, or to become the Reich woman's leader. Uh, so she establishes the German Women's Enterprise uh, and that basically has six million members and it's used to spread ideas about kind of Nazi views for women. Um, so, for example, they would offer courses on, on kind of domestic activities, so like childcare, cooking, uh, and they would train women for a life in the domestic sphere. Uh, now, the, pr the problem for the Nazis was on kind of on taking power in 1933, the birth rate had plummeted. So in 1900, the uh, Germany was seeing 2 million births per year, whereas by 1933 that had fallen to 1 million. Now that if that's a significant drop, and that would mean fewer workers, fewer soldiers, which goes against Hitler's vision for Germany as a powerful, strong country. So he comes up with uh, four different kind of key solutions. So the first solution is the law for the encouragement of marriage. So that would be where there would be loans given of up to a thousand marks, and that's eight months' wages, and that would incentivize families to to marry. And the more children they had, the more the loan was written off. There were divorce laws were changed as well. So if a wife was uh, infertile or could not produce a child or did not want a child, the husband could divorce her. Uh, whereas beforehand he couldn't. That was not valid grounds for divorce, but now he could. Uh, the Mother's Cross was an award given to women for the number of children they had. So if you had four to five children, you'd get bronze. Six to seven would get silver, and then eight and above would get a gold. And if you had more than ten, you'd have to name Hitler as the godfather, okay? Uh, and Adolf if it was a boy. Uh, and then finally we have the Liebensborn, so that translates to Fountain of Life program, and that encourages single women to breed with SS men to create what is known as genetically or racially pure children. Uh, so um, you can you can see how obviously how significant that is to to Hitler's vision for society. 
Um, in terms of women and employment, women were initially encouraged to leave work and kind of follow the three Ks, so Kinder, Kulka and Kircher. Um, so policies to reduce the number of working women. So have a little read through these independently. Um, but just to give you some examples, so 1933 women were banned from all professional posts. 1936 no woman could become a judge or a lawyer. Um, so they're kind of being taken out of key professions. Now, it is successful because ultimately fewer women went to university, the birth rate increased and unemployment amongst German men fell, which suggests that fewer women were working, which led to more jobs for men. Um, so that's how we might argue it was a success. However, there were failures. So the, Gertrude schultz clink experienced significant opposition. 1937, women were allowed to work. And actually, the number of women in work increases during this period. Okay, It increases from 5 million in 1933 to 7 million by 1939. And that's because war was looming. So they needed to get women in the factories uh, producing armaments uh, and contributing to the war effort. Okay, so now we move on to Hitler's vision for the youth. So the youth are seen as kind of the most important. So Hitler famously said that, you know, we might, might not be able to convince adults, but we can convince the youth to follow us, okay? Uh, and it's, they're critical to his future. So he believes that boys and girls are of equal importance, but that they are different and have different roles. Um, and um, you can see here the fact that the uh, other youth groups upon him taking power, that is the worst line of all time, uh, upon him taking power in 1932, there were other youth groups which are more important. So the Protestant church youth group had 600,000 uh, boys and girls uh, in, in, in kind of their uh, membership. Um, so for Hitler, his vision needs to be how can he replace these other youth groups and make the Nazi youth groups the most important. So what he does is in 1933, he, is he bans almost all other youth groups. And instead, these are the ones that are available or open to boys and girls. So based upon your age, you would be placed in a different youth group. So if you're a six to 10, you are placed in what is known as the PIMF, uh, 10 to 14, the Deutsche Jungvolk, uh, and then finally 14 to 18, the Hitler Jugend, which is the Hitler Youth, okay? Now for the Hitler Youth, that's your key case study, and you need to be aware of the four different types of training. So political training, physical training, military training, and character training. Uh, and if I were you, I'd pause and, and have a read through and make notes on, on those individually. Essentially, political training is about them being loyal to Hitler. Physical training is about them camping and hiking and preparing their bodies physically. Military is obviously giving them the skills needed to, to, to do well in war. So map reading, small arms, so kind of gun training and so on. And then character training is about kind of establishing discipline. So having ice baths and uh, punishing exercises and so on. Girls, for girls, sorry, there were two different youth groups. As you can see, uh, it's not compulsory for girls uh, from um, the age of six onwards. So it's from the age of 10 onwards. Uh, and from 1939, that's all youth groups are made compulsory. So the young models, so the young maidens, was open to 10 to 14 year old girls. And then for the League of German Maidens, we have the Bund Deutscher Madel as, uh, as, as the option for older girls, so 14 to 21. Uh, and they were very similar to the Hitler Youth. So there would be there were political activities, there were physical and character building activities, and so on. The key differences, though, is that the the, the focus and the vision. Uh, was different. So girls are trained to cook, iron, make beds, sew and become a housewife and they're taught the importance of the kind of racial hygiene and sleeping with the right men and having children with the right men. Okay, In particular pure Aryan uh, men. So uh, the key thing as well for your notes is you want to make a note of uh, the kind of membership in the uh, Nazi party youth groups. So the fact that 1933 goes from two and a half million and then by 1939 it's eight and a half million all right and that's both the hitler youth and the league of german maidens <coughs> excuse me so um we can also link in with the youth we can talk about the control of the education system so the fact that hitler was against the old system where education was voluntary after the age of 14 and the church has control of some schools uh, and what he does is he makes one of his closest colleagues bernard rust education minister and his view is that the whole purpose of education was to create Nazis. So teachers had to swear an oath of loyalty that to join the Nazi Teachers League and any teacher or head teacher which didn't follow um, kind of the, the stipulations and the guidance set out by the league would be fired. All right. So in Prussia, 
It rushed sacks over 180 head teachers uh, in 1933. Nazi Teachers Leagues ran courses for teachers and trained them, and 200,000 of them had attended one of these courses by 1939. And all lessons had to begin with the Nazi salute and end with Heil Hitler, and Nazi symbols were found throughout. Um, and in terms of the education system, this is how the education system changed. So I won't go through all of this, but again, I would pause and I would have a read through if I were you. Um, but there's new school subjects added, so race studies, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, maths and other traditional subjects were changed to make them more useful. Uh, PE and sport was doubled to kind of make children strong. Uh, and then kind of the focus of the curriculum was varied depending upon if you were girls or if you were boys. So if you were a girl, the kind of domestic education was, was more seen as more important. Um, and then we, we, that brings us on to employment, living standards and the economy, um, which is the final topic before we look at the treatment of minority groups. So in January 1933, 25% of Germans were unemployed, whereas by 1939, only 0 0.5 million Germans were unemployed. Um, now, the, we've got to think about, well, well, how did they actually solve this issue of five to six million people uh, being unemployed. And they do that through uh, three things uh, which you can see on the screen. So the labour service, autobahns and rearmament. So labour service was basically paid work for the unemployed um, and it was usually kind of work on, on public work, so repairing roads, planting trees, and it does actually become compulsory for the unemployed. Uh, it's not very popular, uh, but it does lead you know, to mass employment. So mass employment, so 400,000 plus were employed from 1935 onwards. The autobahns was a uh, kind of a, a massive I infrastructure project designed to improve transport. So basically an autobahn is like a road, usually a bit like a motorway. Uh, and in 1935, there were 125,000 men employed in building these motorways. So again, that's going to be reducing the number of unemployed men. Uh, and with that, you know, better roads and bridges leads to better movement of goods, which leads to a better economy, which usually means less unemployment. So it also had an indirect effect on unemployment as well. And then in rearmament, uh, the fact that one, nearly one and a half million men had been conscripted into the armed forces by 1939 shows again how unemployment was dealt with. Um, so again, that, that was another salute to unemployment. Um, but let's not forget, though, that the, the, the figures aren't fully accurate. Okay? So there, there are lots of issues with these figures. And in particular, these are some major issues. So women and Jews who may have wanted jobs were forced to give up work. Um, so they are not classed. So that although they weren't working, they're not classed in the unemployed statistics because they're not seen as, as being unemployed. Um, men who would have been unemployed were found jobs in the labour service. So they're given compulsory work that they wouldn't have found otherwise. And people who could only find part-time work were counted as fully employed. So if you were working for just a couple of days a week, you were classed as fully employed. Um, and there's some other, for those of you targeting grade nine, there's some other kind of methods that they actually use to reduce unemployment figures. So to make their, their data look better. So I again, pause the video and have a look. Um, but it's also worth bearing in mind as well that unemployment was falling everywhere at the time. So, you know, in Britain, there was a reduction in the numbers of unemployed people by one million people. Um, and this was all part of a, nat a natural recovery after the Great Depression uh, across Europe. Admittedly, it did. Uh, it was reduced by the most significant amount in Germany. Um, so that is testament to the fact that the Nazis employed a range of policies to deal with this. Um, but let's not forget that it is a pattern that was seen across Europe as well. <clears throat> right, um, I promise we're nearly there. So standard of living, um, this is basically how kind of the, the lives of Germans were bettered. So wages did rise, but there was also a, a rise in, uh, or an increase in food prices as well. So you can see in the table on the right hand side, the fact that wages uh, increased between 1934 and 1939 by 20%. Um, now, food prices increasing meant that the lowest members of society didn't actually benefit that much from this, okay? Whereas the higher skilled workers who were earning more anyway, they saw a, a bigger shift and a bigger increase in their wages, so they tended to be better off. Uh, at the same time, the number of hours worked by uh, the average German worker uh, rose, so the people were working for more hours. Uh, and the labour front, so the DAF, was actually set up to replace trade unions, which had been banned, and they 
kind of protect it was an organization pr that which protected the rights of workers by establishing their rights and the maximum length of the working week and minimum pay levels so that basically safeguarded the workers and improved their standard of living in some ways but some might say that workers were worse off uh, because they could no longer negotiate personally with their employers um, and because the the average working week had increased under the labor front as part of the labor front there was a division called strength through joy and their kind of whole aim was to <coughs> make work more enjoyable for german people so they would hold a variety of events uh, and benefits for people who were in employment so sports events films theater shows and all of that was to try and make work a lot more enjoyable and to encourage more people to be employed uh, similarly the strength through joy organized kind of a uh, funding for volkswagen so a new a new car created by Porsche and this Volkswagen uh, so the Volkswagen Beetle was going to be a car that was available to the masses but most people didn't actually receive it and that's because you know all the factories had to change from making cars to preparing for war um, and also as a subdivision within the strength through joy division we th there was also something called the beauty of labor and that basically campaigned to get better facilities for workers in their place um, and in particular, there were four groups in addition to Jewish people who was kind of were the who bore the brunt of of Nazi hatred. So Slavs, who were seen as untermenschen, um, and Hitler wanted to invade and conquer their countries uh, for his kind of desire for more living space for Lebensraum, but they were persecuted less than the other minorities. Gypsies, who follow an itinerant lifestyle, so they move from place to place. Uh, there was only 26,000 of them, but in 1933 they started to be sent to concentration camps. Uh, in 1936 there were special camps made for them, and from 1939 onwards the aim was to deport all gypsies. And during the Holocaust many gypsies lost their lives, as did homosexuals, disabled people and Slavs as well. Uh, for homosexuals, in 1935 the Nazis strengthened the laws against them, uh, and it now became seen as a crime. And in 1938, 8,000 people were arrested for homosexuality. Uh, many of them were sent to concentration camps. Uh, and the Nazis encouraged the voluntary castration of homosexuals uh, as a way to kind of prevent homosexuality from happening. Uh, disabled people, so the 1933 law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring uh, basically made it compulsory for people to be sterilised if they were disabled. So to sterilise means you cannot have children in the future. So 400,000 people experienced that. And then as a step kind of even further uh, in, in terms of the horrific treatment of disabled people, uh, in 1939 there was a famous T4 programme which basically said that disabled babies with severe disabilities were to be murdered. And then that was later expanded to children up to the age of 17. So 5,000 children with disabilities were killed uh, up to the age of 17. And then finally, it comes on to persecution of Jewish people. So we do not actually cover the Holocaust. Uh, we go kind of all the way up to 1939. Um, but yeah, so you don't actually get to cover the Holocaust and the death camps or anything like that uh, as part of this course. So the kind of key starting point, we might say, for persecution of Jews was with the Nuremberg Laws. Oh, sorry, I've got my slides the wrong way around. Uh, so I will have to talk through this because I don't think I'm going to be able to. Uh, go back so I'll talk through all the key information so you might want to pause it here and then uh, and then we'll go back or maybe I can go back uh, so in terms of the persecution of Jewish people there were 437,000 Jews uh, living in Germany in 1933 that's less than 1% of the population and in terms of their persecution uh, their persecution began in 1933 uh, it started off by kind of Nazi press and media calling them vermin and filth then Jewish people were banned from government jobs, teachers were sacked, and they were prevented from inheriting land, and then there was a boycott of Jewish uh, shops and businesses, and the stormtroopers in April kind of painted Jewish stars or the word Judah outside Jewish businesses and told people to boycott those businesses. And then from 1935 onwards, Jewish people were banned from the army, and some local councils banned Jews from parks and swimming, swimming pools. Uh, from 1935, it kind of developed in terms of anti-Semitism, so the Nuremberg Laws, so we had the Reich Law on Citizenship. Uh, by the way, all the information on this was on the previous slide, but when I'm recording on PowerPoint, I can't actually go back, so you just need to kind of just re rewind the video a little bit. So the Reich Law on Citizenship stipulated that only those of German blood could be German citizens, and then they restrict 
uh, of the right, and Jewish people were stripped of the right of citizenship, so they lost their passports essentially. Uh, there's also another law introduced in Nuremberg in 1935, which was the Reich Law for the Protection of German Blood and Honor, and that meant that Jewish people were forbidden from marrying German citizens, and it was prohibited. Then persecution intensified from 1935 to 38. So Jewish people had to register their possessions, which made it easier for them to be confiscated, and they had to carry identity cards. And then finally, we finished with Kristallnacht, which stands for the Night of Broken Glass, and that refers to the damage done to Jewish businesses and shops uh, on the 9th and 10th of November 1938. It started off with a Polish Jew killing a German in the German embassy in Paris, and that was used as a pretext for violence against Jews. So Goebbels called on people to stir up trouble, um, so he told the newspapers to condemn the attack and he sent the uh, stormtroopers and Schutzstaffel and Gestapo to attack local synagogues. Hitler then got involved and encouraged local Nazi leaders, uh, so local Nazi governors as well, uh, to encourage attacks on Jewish people. And the police were told not to prevent any violence against Jews. And, it, and the violence was very widespread. So at least 814 shops, 171 homes and 191 synagogues were damaged and 100 Jewish people were killed. And let's not forget that those are the official figures. So those figures are probably very mu kind of much higher because the Nazis would have wanted to downplay the amount of people hurt and killed. So ultimately, the consequence of Crystal Nacht is is devastation for the Jewish community. And what's made it worse? What made it worse was that Jewish people were blamed for the events, and they were actually fined one billion marks to pay for the damage. Uh, and then twenty thousand Jews were sent to concentration camps as a result. And then finally, in January 1939, Jewish people would, uh, were, it was decided that all Jewish people were to be ex uh, deported from Germany, which pretty much brings us to the end of the course. Okay, so what I would suggest is that you watch this video maybe a couple of times through, because I do go through a lot of evidence, a lot of information, but that does cover everything you need for the, the second half of Weimar Germany. So that will give, now give you the full set of videos both in terms of content, but also how to approach the exam paper. Right then, I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you very much for listening. Work. All right, we're on the final topic now. So the persecution of minorities in Nazi society. So there was an emphasis on two things, such as uh, which are known as eugenics and racial hygiene. So eugenics is the idea, and it's based upon Charles Darwin's idea of evolution, that some human beings are better suited to life, and that others are inferior or unsuitable for breeding. Um, so that was used to justify uh, a lot of the racist policies that the Nazis followed. Uh, and in school, students were taught about something called racial hygiene, which is the idea that Aryan Germans should only reproduce with other Aryans, okay, instead of you know, marrying people who were seen as lesser. Uh, and as a result, there was laws introduced which banned mixed race marriages um, because to try and prevent um, Aryan or people from the Aryan race uh, marrying uh, people who weren't from the Aryan race. And Hitler's views himself were that the Aryans were superior, uh, that other races should be classed as untermenschen, so subhuman, and that the worst of the worst, so the, the worst untermenschen, were gypsies and Jews. And then Hitler said that they were Liebensunwerts, which means unworthy of life. Again, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation on a lot of these words, but... Uh, the the spelling is correct, so just learn the spelling. Kind of a Nazi control and dictatorship between 1933 and 1939. 